Glad to see everyone here in the house of the Lord today. Great, beautiful day outside. So how many of you have a smartphone that you have with you? Have it with you? Not Ryan's gone. Anybody? A smartphone? All right. So um, those, some of you are in the first service here, so you, you know what's coming. Uh, but I want you to take your smartphone out, and you get to do something in church that you probably will never have the opportunity to get again. <laughs> so you want to take advantage of this. Go ahead. Yes, at least not legally. You may have done this without permission, uh, but now then you get permission. So I want you to get your smartphone out and turn the camera on. And uh, if you don't have a smartphone, anybody have not have a smartphone with you? All right, but Brian does, so you know him, right? Anybody, uh, anybody else? If you don't have a, a phone, with a, a camera phone with you, raise your hand because then somebody can come alongside of you. All right, there we go. All right, so what I want you to do is turn that camera on and then set it up so you can take a picture of yourself or the people that are with you. And uh, I'm going to count out three, and on the count of three, everybody's going to take a picture of themselves. And this is, if you don't know, this is called a selfie, right? Or a groupie, if, it, if it's that way. All right, so ready? Uh, here we go. One, two, three, boom. One, two, okay, and mine counts down, and I always forget that, so then I, you know, I'm looking at it, and then it counts down, and I look away or something. So, now, take, take that picture and just pull it back up on your screen, and you go, oh, wow, that's what I look like? <laughs> and Brandon, you missed, you missed being able to take a selfie with your wife and baby. They took off. So, you're, you're probably thinking, what in the world? Why, why did he have us do this? Well, listen to Philippians chapter 3. Verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in God in Christ Jesus. Now I want to read that same portion of Scripture plus a couple other verses from the message, a different translation. So this is Philippians 3, 12 through 16 from the message. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made. Now, just as an aside, this one's free. Uh, if you've ever felt like you don't have it all together, you're in really good company because Paul said the same thing. So if you don't feel like you got it all put together, you're okay as long as you know Jesus Christ and, and are, are serving him and committing him because none of us have it all together. Paul said that. But he said, <clears throat> I am well on my way reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this. This is Paul talking, right? And he's saying, I don't consider myself to be an expert. But I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Boy, I like that. So let's keep focused on that goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. I want to read that again. Let's keep focused on that goal, the goal of Jesus. Those of us who want everything God has for us. How many want God, what God has for you? Now, do you want everything you want that God has for you? What if it means changing something in your life? Yeah, that's what most of us would do. Okay, we, we, uh, you sure about that, God? You, you sure that's important? I, I don't know. Um, so when we say we, that we want everything God has for us, there might be something that he says, if you want this, then there's something that you have to do to be able to put yourself in a position to be the recipient of it. It's not that God's mean or nasty or, or you know, a big ogre or he's got the carrot that's dangling out in front of the donkey whole routine saying, come on. You know, when you teach your kids to walk and you show them a the little piece of candy and, they, <laughs> and then you pull it away, just a couple more steps so they take up more. No, God's not that way. But if we want everything that he has for us, then we have to be willing to change so that we become like him, all right? If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. So what does this scripture have to do with selfies or groupies or taking pictures? That's a good question. So in our world today, 
these things and all the other things that go along with technology. I've got an iPad, I've got a, a Windows tablet, I've got a smartphone, I've got a Mac computer, I've got a Windows laptop, I've got uh, a, a Windows desktop, I've got four servers, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm buried up to the eyeballs in technology. You want to pay my electric bill? <laughs> And, you know, so we are inundated with electri uh, electronics and we're wrapped up within it. But within our world today, those who study the interaction of humanity, they're expressing some concern about all this stuff and how it inter inter uh, interferes or could interfere with our real interaction. We're becoming so connected virtually that we're, not be that we're losing connection personally. Again, I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying what some, some people that study that stuff say. All right, and so we're so wrapped up in all of this that we have a tendency to lose out in this. You know, how many friends do you have on Facebook? How many friends do you have on Facebook that you've never met in your life? <laughs> all right, and I'm not saying they're not friends. I'm just saying that you never, there's how much connection is there really? And I'm not down on social media. That's not the point of this. Just stay with me another couple minutes and we'll get there. So there's also a developing concern that with all the advent of this kind of stuff and the ability to take ridiculously phenomenal pictures with something that you carry in, in your hand that's not a camera, there are times that I wish my phone just would work as a phone. Concept. But we get so involved in capturing the moment that we are actually missing the moment. So that when we look at things if we don't have a picture there, we, we have no concept of even being there. That we lose sight of the wonder and the awe of what we're encountering and facing because we're more concerned about capturing that moment on, on the camera. So we can post it on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter accounts and all those kind of things. Again, I'm not saying this is true or not. I'm just saying there are people that are concerned about that. My point in that in all this, and whether we're taking pictures and posting them on social media or not, is sort of immaterial. My, my point is that if you take and look at that picture that you took just a few minutes, oh, it, the point is it's in the past. Every picture that's ever been taken is a capturing of a moment that is past. A moment that you will never again capture in real life. I'm not saying that I'm not down on pictures. I like pictures. I like looking at pictures. I, I enjoy looking at pictures, and they do. If you've lived the moment and you look at the picture, you relive the moment. You, you can sense the emotions in the moment and the, oh, I was doing this in the moment, all this kind of thing. So I'm not down on pictures, but sometimes we get so concerned about capturing the moment spiritually that we miss the moment that God is trying to bring us into. So we need to take a look at our spiritual life, our walk with God, and compare that to Scripture. God is the God who said to Israel, when you cross through the Jordan River, I want you to take 12 stones and build a memorial there in the Jordan, and then I want you to take 12 other stones and carry them with you to the other side. And when you get to the other side, I want you to take those stones and build a memorial there. But he said build a memorial. He didn't say build your house. The point was... And the scripture goes on and says this, that as you're walking around with your sons or your daughters and your sons and your daughters who did not experience the crossing of the Jordan River, when they come to that pile of stones and they go, what's this whole pile of stones for? Well, let me tell you about the time that we came to the Jordan River and God opened it for us and we walked across. And it's a memorial. It's a point of remembrance. It's a point of saying God did something phenomenal for us at this point. And if he did it for us there, he'll do it for us over here and as we face this circumstance and situation. But God does not want us to go to the stones of the Jordan River and build our house there. If that is what Israel had done as they came out of the Jordan River, Jericho would have never been conquered. The walls would have never come down. Israel would never have been conquered. Remember what they said about Israel? There's grapes that are huge and that's flowing with milk and honey. If they had stayed at the side of the Jordan River and enjoyed the moment... They would have never experienced the things that God had for them in the future. 
So as much as important it is for us to be thankful and grateful for everything that God has done for us, we cannot allow ourselves to get trapped into a selfie where that's where we live, when all the time God has got a thousand more beyond what we've experienced, blessings and promises and victories and things that will just make us drop our jaw and go, wow, he's got all that for us. But if I stay looking at the picture, then I miss all of that. Normally, when we talk about that scripture, I've typically heard it said when you're talking about that verse, forgetting the things in the past. It's always the negative stuff. Okay, so you committed a sin, but Jesus Christ doesn't remember it. It's under the blood, it's washed, and and that's true. But I think there's actually a bigger danger when we get stuck in the blessings that God has bestowed on us, and we forget that there's a whole lot more. Now this came to me while Brother Hernandez was preaching and what powerful services we had with Brother Hernandez. So in no way is this derogatory what happened. Phenomenal things that happened. He preached to us from the word of God. He prophesied to us from God's word. And one of the things that struck me is that God has created this whole spiritual garden full of fruit that we just have to take. But the point is, if I just stay last Sunday when he said that, then I'm going to be right back where he was encouraging us not to be. And we're going to miss. Okay, so we grabbed some fruit last weekend. But how about this weekend? How about next weekend? How about Wednesday when you get up in the morning or Thursday when you're fighting traffic? God is still God and there's still victories and there's still promises and there's still things that he wants to accomplish in life. But I can't get trapped in a picture of the past. God bless you all. Again, I apologize.
We are in the house of God on a Sunday afternoon. It is so good to be here, and I am delighted today to have Stephen come forward. How many? Ste that one right there. They did some uh, pastor appreciation in the first service, and uh, we appreciate that so much, but they didn't have anything to give him, so we sent people over to uh, Dunkin' Donuts to... <laughs> We, we found it. But with all the stuff that Stephen does, uh, uh, you know, young people are, are fun to work with, and yet they have their ups and downs, and there are, there are seasons where there are struggles. There are seasons of great harvesting. There are seasons of great sacrifice and prayer and anguish that a youth pastor has. Just ask me. I was there three times. So I, I know, and I'm not doing it four, so you <laughs> don't get any ideas. But there's a lot of time invested, and most of the time that we invest is behind the scenes, of which there is no thankfulness, there is no gratitude, there, are, there is no acknowledgement. So I, I want, being there and knowing what I went through, I, want, I would wonder if we could just put our hands together and thank Stephen and Emily for all that they do. <clears throat> and there you go. Go Packers. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Would you remain standing? But it really is, it really is a labor of love, and uh, you really you don't want to do any kind of ministry unless you're called into it because there are high highs and then there are low lows. And what happens is you can enjoy the high highs. Anybody could. But when things go bad, when somebody's in trouble, when, when, when that comes, then you carry, you, 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 you are yoked with those young people and you carry that incredible burden with you. And it affects every part of your life. You can't punch out. You can't go to the clock and put that little time chart, time stamp in there and, and leave. You can't do that because, you know, a young person may need you in the middle of the night. They... And so you're, you're around the clock. You're available. And so you carry that with you. You go to prayer. You go to your dinner. You're holding your little, your little Audrey. And you think, you know, think people's names come to your mind and you're praying for them. So, but I appreciate their, uh, both of their dedication. I know Stephen is a youth pastor, but Emily does as much or maybe even more. But we, we thank you for that. <clears throat> John chapter 13 and verse 1. We will try to continue to minister uh, to you. We are thankful that you're here. We look forward to good things. God wants to do something special for us today. Um, when I, I read the Word of God, um, as I read it, I try, to, I try to feel after God and say, God, what, what is it that you want to say to these people? They're, they're investing their time and energy, etc., and I just want you to do something for them today, and I don't want a canned message. I didn't get this off the internet. Got this out of the Bible, and I just pray that something in here would be ministering to you today. John chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew. Would you say that Jesus knew? We have a tendency to forget that sometimes. You know, <laughs> watch what you do because Jesus is watching. They usually use that negative. Let's use it positive. If you're having a struggle or if you need something, Jesus knows. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly the solution to take care of your problem, but Jesus knows. He knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of, out of this world unto the Father, meaning enter the, leaving the flesh world, entering the spirit world, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. So even though Jesus knew what was about to happen, that his time was up, and that he was entering a time of great suffering and pain and rejection, it says he loved them unto the end. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you and I. I'm not even sure how Jesus did it. But when Jesus knew what he was headed into, there's a lot of us that would maybe change our minds. We, if, you knew exa if you knew that you were going to get into an accident, if you drove down County Farm, County Farm Road, you'd probably take Highway 59. You'd say, you know what, since I know that I'm about ready to head into a bunch of trouble, I think I'll avoid it. Or we would make decisions, or we would determine how we bless people based upon, I'll send you a Christmas card 
if you send me a Christmas card. But Jesus, his decisions were not based on what was going to happen. He had the will of God in his life, and he decided, I'm going to do this no matter what the outcome. And when we think, why did Jesus do it even though he knew? And it was, it was right there. He loved them unto the end. His incredible love for you and for me is unconditional. It's not based upon everything going right. It's not based upon us making every right decision. It's not based upon us never failing God. He said, I'm going to love him to the end. And verse 2, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing, say Jesus knew. He knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. He raised from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. There are some things that Jesus does, even in this moment. But we have to have enough faith to say, Lord, I trust you. Peter looked at him and he said, you're going to wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will understand. I wonder if we could trust Jesus just for the next few minutes. Just trust him that what he's about to do in us, we may not understand right now, but I like how he said, you don't know what I'm doing now but thou shalt know hereafter. After I'm done, you're going to understand what I'm up to. That's the hardest part. If you knew now what God was going to do, it would be much easier to allow him to do it. But when you don't understand what he's doing, sometimes we hesitate and we don't receive, like Brother Manley said, no, we did not talk. About commitment, about, about receiving more from God than, than, than we typically do. There is so much more waiting to come to us. But we have to be able to trust and not necessarily understand now, but know that God will give us the understanding. And look at verse 11. For he knew, there it is again, who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. Even though Jesus knew, it was said redundantly many times that he knew, he still did it. He still washed Judas' feet. He washed the other's feet, even though Peter denied him. He didn't say, well, I'll wash your feet, but Peter's going to deny me. I'm going to skip him. Oh, Judas, I'll skip him, and I'll wash your feet. He did it all because he loves us all. Would you mind praying with me just for a moment as I preach on the subject, when God is committed, when God is committed. Lord, we love you today. We pray that you would touch us, talk to us. We pray that you would Take us to a place where we experience more of you than we ever have before. And that even though we may not understand, a lack of understanding brings fear, brings concern. But would you help us to open up our heart to you to the extent that you will take us to a place that we've never been, we pray. We trust you, Lord. We pray that you would have your way in our life. In Jesus' name. Could you say in Jesus' name? <clears throat> God bless you. You may be seated. John 2.23, in my text that I didn't finish, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So the miracles that Jesus did, they had the context of helping people believe in his name. I mean, if somebody said, you know, I'm the Messiah, and you're like, okay, that's cool, and all of a sudden he, he raises the dead, you say, I believe in that. There's something about you. Even Nicodemus said, we know that thou art from God because of all the things that you do because God is with you. So it says many believed in his name when they saw the miracles. So let me even stop short of that. There are people that believe in God without even reading the Bible tradition. Maybe it's what they were taught. Maybe they went to Sunday school when they were a kid. But they believe in his name. But this went even further. It says they believed in his name when they saw the miracles. 
So they didn't believe in him until they saw the miracles. So the miracles actually helped them to believe in his name. But verse 24 says something very strange. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. So there is a believing that can come without committing, without him committing to us. There is a miracle that can come to us without us actually drawing his commitment to us. In other words, he can allow us to believe. He can allow us to have a miracle, and yet something in our life or something that is lacking in our life can cause him to, to, to halt his commitment to us. He said Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. One commentator said this, Jesus didn't have faith in their faith. In other words, your faith is good enough to receive a miracle. Your faith is good enough to believe in that, that I am the Messiah, but it's not good enough to allow my committing to you. My, good, my question today, and it's, what, and it's the whole premise upon this message, is if I believe in his name and I believe enough, I have enough faith to receive a miracle. My question is, if Jesus didn't commit to people like that, what is he holding back from me? What could I receive today if I was totally committed to the point that he trusts in my trust? He has faith in my faith, and he's committed to my commitment. Something, they received a miracle, or at least saw one, and because of that, they believed in him, but for some reason, these people had drawn a line and said, you know, I'm just not going to go that far. And when that happened, the Bible says that Jesus didn't commit unto them. My goodness, for somebody who gave his only life for us, who gave his back to the whip, and he gave his cheeks to those that plucked off the hair, they beat him beyond recognition, that's commitment. I've not done that, and neither have you. But even so, Jesus made a commitment to salvation as a whole. But even so, he didn't make that extra commitment to us because he didn't trust us. Which tells me this, miracles don't prove commitment. But commitment should have miracles. The Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Believe is a greater word than just an understanding. Believe means commitment to entrust oneself to. It means to give one. All right, if I believe, if I believe that you're not going to the, pull the chair out from under me, I'll sit down. But if I don't believe that, I'm not sitting down. So there is an action. There is more of a commit. I'm going to commit myself to the chair. I'm going to, go get, I'm going to make myself vulnerable to that commitment. And if something happens, then I get, then I get hurt. I get, uh, uh, my, my feelings get hurt, etc. But they believed in him for miracles, but not enough for Jesus to commit to them. I want Jesus to commit everything to me. I want to position myself to where if I need something, that I just have to say, hey, hey, Jesus. I'm not arrogant, but I know what you did for me. I know you went to the cross. I know you went to the scourging post and, I, and post, and I know you promised me that if I will pray and I will humble myself before you, you will answer my prayer and you will take care of my situation. Let's do it. I don't want him saying um, a miracle and then see there's skid marks behind him as he stops and says, I don't know, I'm not going to commit to that situation. What is it that he was going to commit to and didn't? What is it? Do you want to find out? I want to find out. I know that there's more of God that I can receive that I don't have right now. There is a scripture that says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. What is the spirit of the prophet? It's God. That's subject. God is subject to the prophet. What does that mean? It means like the water tower just down the road, Bartlett Water Tower. If you tried to lift that, it would be absolutely impossible. 
to lift that with your own personal strength. But I can control that tower by the faucet that's in my bathroom in this church. I can take that little faucet and I can, control, I can turn it on and the water comes out and I can turn it off and that water turns off. I can, if I leave it on, I could actually affect that whole tower. That's like what the power of God is in our life. We can literally, we are that faucet. The power of God is unlimited. I know the water tower is not unlimited, but it's a good illustration. There's more water in there than you can drink, than you can shower with, you know, than you can water your lawn with. Okay? There's way more than you need, but it's controlled by the faucet. And that's you and that's me. We are a faucet. There is a power of God that wants to flow through your life and my life. But we regulate it by this little faucet we call our will. And we say, you know, I've got just enough. Oh, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. And all of a sudden, we feel the pressure of God's, and we turn it, oh, just turn it off a little bit. Did you ever try to take a drink out of a full-fledged fire hydrant? It'll blow you over. Turn it down a little bit. But there are times when I've seen people just get so slain in the spirit, and I'm like, man, I want that. And every time I've said that, God says, what's your problem? Ah! Inside, you're saying, man, that looks good. You know, people are lost in the spirit, and they're just, they're just enjoying it. You're like, man, that looks good. And he's like, so what you waiting for? Somebody help me with my faucet. I want more of that. What I'm talking about is what God gives us seems to be enough. To help us to make it through the day. We come to church and we feel the goose pump, goose pump machine go off. And, and we're like, woo, there, I feel God. And now I'm going home and I'm all the same. And what we've done is we've had, our, we've had a big pipe wrench on that faucet getting ready. Just in case God really pours something off to turn that off. Oh, slow that down a little bit. Don't sneak up on me, God. What we need to do is turn that thing wide open. And say, just come on, commit to me, Lord. Commit it all to me. I'm wide open. God gives himself completely to those that give themselves to him completely. Am I perfect? No. There are, we all deal with this, this self-will. We deal with ourselves and we say, well, I want to. And we look and we say, oh, that looks so good. And God's like, well, why don't you do it? I don't know. I want to do it, but I just... <sighs> I want to do, Paul said, I want to do things that are right, and I don't, and there's things that I know I shouldn't do, and I do, and it's, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of sin? What am I doing? I'm fighting against my flesh, but God is saying, I will commit more to you than you've received up till now. If you're willing to make yourself committed, they who trust in him that he is sure that they will follow him even though they can't see where he's going. When you don't know where Jesus is going, do you just say, hey, no problem? Or do you chew your fingernails off? Boy, does God know what he's doing? He's a little late. We can... This finger's a little low, but that, that one got smashed. But do we worry that God knows what he's doing? Or do we throw ourselves at it and say, come on, Daddy, catch me. Do, does he, do you stand at the edge, at the edge of the, and you say, Jesus, you're going to catch me? Yeah, come on. You go, you go first. You, but what I'm saying is, we're, we're at the edge of something incredibly powerful. I don't even know what's about to happen in this church, but something greater than me and something greater than, 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 than an organization, something greater than just doctrine, something incredibly powerful. God is positioning this church to receive something so powerful, but it's going to require us saying, I can't see where I'm going to land. I don't know if he's going to reach out and grab me, but you know what? Every time in the past when he has said something, he has kept his word, and I'm going to trust him right now. You know, you can keep a gazelle in a small pen as long as the gazelle can't see where it's going to land, even though that gazelle can jump 12 feet in the air. 
If it can't see where it's going to land, it won't jump a three-foot fence. Even though it can jump 12 feet. How high can you jump? But you don't try to get over that fence of doubt. You don't try to get over that fence of yesterday's blessing. You don't try to cross that barrier of yesterday's comfort zone experience because you can't see where you're going to land. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to catch you. Just jump. Just trust me. Take a step. What is he waiting for us to do? What is he waiting to give us? All I know is this. People believed in his name and they received or saw miracles happen and yet he didn't commit himself to them. It was like he wanted to and he hesitated. This is not a bad message. This is a positive message. This is saying we've already believed in his name. We've already seen just multitude of miracles that he's done. But it says he didn't commit himself. Jesus, what could I possibly have done? Or what could I do that would take away your hesitation of commitment? What would God do if he was allowed to be committed? I don't know about you, but a God who can do absolutely anything? When I think about what his potential is, it's limitless, and yet I can do something. He did not many works there because of their unbelief. We can literally bind God as far as what he wants to do. I want to, but I don't feel, I don't feel trusted enough to commit myself to that situation. We have to trust in him, not just in one or two matters. There are things that, that are easy for us to trust him with. Well, you know, you read the Bible and it says you have to repent. Okay, well, I'll trust him with that. It says we have to get baptized. Well, I can trust him with that. But getting the Holy Ghost, ooh, I don't know. Some people can get the Holy Ghost the first time. You talking about baptism? Oh, I don't know. Some people get the Holy Ghost, get baptized, they repent. Everything's going fine. And then you talk about giving to God. Oh, I don't know. It's something in our life is a weakness, whatever that seems to be. And God says, I don't want you to just trust me in one or two areas or in most areas. I want all of it. If you will commit all to me, then I will commit all to you. Matthew 26 says, Then Jesus saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended. <clears throat> this is going to be my little soapbox for taking the word of God as it is. All ye shall be offended because of me this night. Everyone say all. If God said all, then that means all. And he said, for it is written. He said, I'm telling you, you're going to be offended at me tonight. And he said, besides, the Old Testament, it's written. It says this, I will smite the sheep, shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. So he said it, and then he quoted Old Testament scripture. And for most of us, that would be okay, but maybe not for everything. <laughs> well, I know the Bible. I've had people tell me, well, I know the Bible says that, but. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I love Jesus, though. I'm like, wait a minute. Notice what happened here with Peter in verse 33. What, say all. All will be offended, right? Peter answered and said unto them, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Didn't Jesus just say all would be offended? Yes. Well, then if Jesus said it, then either Peter would make him a liar or Peter's wrong. And then Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. So Jesus said, all men will be offended. And Peter said, nope, not me. Jesus, you're wrong. Even though you said it, you're wrong. And even though the Old Testament scripture said it, you're wrong. And then Jesus said, before the cock crow, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said unto him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Why is it that our nature will look at the word of God and we will hear God talk through a preacher or through his spirit or through his word and we will hear that and we will say, I know the Bible says that, but why does our nature do that? 
I get frustrated with myself. When you look at the words, the word says it. It's settled. Nothing you and I can do, there's nothing we can do to change the word. If the word says that this is going to happen, if you do this, then it's going to happen. And, and, and why is it that our flesh rises up and it says, well, I know that all of you will fall prey to that scripture, but I, I'm stronger. That applies to everybody but me. But guess what? You all say that. We all think that. Because otherwise, we wouldn't do some of the things that we do. It applies to everybody but me. That was Peter's nature. That was Peter's his response to, to Jesus. He denied Jesus twice before he denied him three times. You're wrong, Jesus. You're wrong, Jesus. We need to look at the word of God and whatever it says. Jesus, you said it, and you don't need to use scripture to prove it to me. But he will anyways. Peter disagreed with him twice. Peter, there's more than the miraculous. There's more than walking on water. I walked on water. I handed out the loaves and the fishes. Yeah, but Peter, you're going to deny Jesus. Oh, no, that'll never happen to me. The miraculous, remember, the miraculous, the miraculous is not greater than a commitment to Jesus. You can have a miracle and still be lost. Wow. We can cause God to commit to us if we will commit to him. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, Matthew chapter 12, how they might destroy him. And there it is again, but when Jesus knew, when Jesus knew, he withdrew himself from thence or there. Jesus knows everything. And when they put this council together to destroy him, I read the scripture where it says he didn't commit. He wouldn't commit to them. Well, Jesus is amongst them. And remember, there was a bunch of, a bunch of sick people that were in the area. Because of the very next scripture that says, then the multitude followed them and he healed them all. Well, obviously there were a bunch of sick sick people in that multitude. So if Jesus was amongst them and there were people that were conspiring against him, he said, not committing. I don't like this area. I'm going to back off of this area and I'm going to come over here. Why? Because those people are not committed. They are trying to conspire against me. I'm going to back off of there and I'm going to go over here and now I'm going to heal them all because I'm amongst committed people. So Jesus literally withdrew himself from people who were not willing to follow him. So he does withdraw. Jesus loves us all. Oh, yes, I will never dispute that point. He loves us all incredibly because there are things that he has done in your life and in mine. Most of the things he's done in my life were not deserved by me. The only things that were deserved were the spankings. (laughs) I deserve those. But any of the blessings that come from heaven, I don't deserve any of that. But there are situations that Jesus will withdraw from. What are you withdrawing from, Jesus? You're withdrawing from from opposition to your word. And when he had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Well, I know about him. I read about him. I can quote you all sorts of scriptures on Jesus. Do you know about him or do you know him? She did not know it was Jesus, even though she was looking right at him. The point here is this, is that commitment will draw you beyond a knowledge of who he is. It will, it will help you know, it will help you know him. Not just about a scripture or about a church or about a doctrine or denomination. It w- he doesn't want you to know about the UPC. And I have no qualms with the UPC. I love the organization. They teach and preach the truth. But it's not about being a part of an organization. It's about being a part of a bride. It's about being his bride, the only bride that will ever marry the groom. And she didn't know it was Jesus. Please don't ever assume that because you know about his name and because you've had a miracle in your life and because you've had an experience in repentance that you know him. Knowing him goes far beyond. Knowing him is a very intimate word. 
Knowing him goes beyond the miraculous. It goes beyond the name. It goes beyond the doctrine. Knowing him. There are people that say, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? When those sons of Sceva were trying to cast out, they were trying to mimic. They, they had the method, but didn't have the relationship. Jesus is not interested in a method. He's not interested in, a, in, in, in an organization. He's interested in a relationship with us because it draws us past. So are we trying to get the loaves and the fishes from him? Or are we interested, interested in that line of commitment that says, if you'll erase that line and say, Lord, I'm committed no matter what, that he will cross that line. And there's no telling what will happen in your life and in my life if we are willing to commit to the extent that he says, that's commitment. I'm willing to step into that relationship. Trust. Notice Psalm 37. I got to finish. Psalm 37. Saw this this morning. It says, trust in the Lord. You know what trust means? Trust means, hey, you're not going to do me wrong. Trust in the Lord and do good. There are actions that come with trust. If I really trust then I will put my actions with it. And he said, if you will trust me, then you shall dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Please notice the, the cadence here. Trust in the Lord and do good. Thou shalt dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of thine heart. Commit the way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. That cadence is there for a reason. He's trying to remind us, you do this, and I'll do this. If you will have faith in me, I'll give you a miracle. If you pursue me, I'll give you truth. If you'll commit, then I'll commit. Notice that. And then 2 Chronicles 7, if my people, if. People don't like that word, because if is always a hinge word. If, if you repent, if you're baptized, that's what he said, if. Here he said, if my people, he wasn't talking to even sinners at that point, if my people which are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Notice he didn't just say humble themselves. He didn't just say pray. He didn't just say seek my face. He said and turn from their wicked ways. God knows that our commitment will lead us past just humbling ourselves. Commitment, real commitment will lead us past just praying. Real commitment will lead us past seeking his face. Because all of that is pursuit of him. But he said, that commitment will cause you to turn from your wicked ways. He's saying, there needs to be both. I don't want you to just pursue me. I want you to turn your back on the wicked ways, whatever that is. He said, that is commitment. And when that happens, remember the if-then statement. If my people will do this, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Well, let me ask us a question. If we don't do those things, will he forgive our sin and will he heal our land? In other words, if we don't commit, will he? He's saying, I will commit, but you have to commit. And once I see your commitment, I will follow through on that commitment. The word believe means to have faith, to entrust, and to commit. So the word believe means and includes commitment. I'm committed. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Well, then do you do what he says? Well, you don't have to do anything. You just need to believe that he existed. The devil believes. In fact, the devil knows how many there are. And it says he trembles. And yet we know he's going to burn forever in a lake of fire. So just believing is not enough. We have to commit. We have to, we have to encapsulate that word believe. And it is an action word. It is an entrusting word. And it is a faith word. Because the Bible says, He that believeth on me, he that's committed, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Commitment versus the reward. Jesus said we would see glory if we commit. I want to see his glory today. John 11 says... 
Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did. So they were talking to Mary. They saw the miracle signs and wonders that Jesus did. They believed on him. There's a second witness. They saw the miracles that Jesus did. And they believed on him. But some. Every time you introduce Jesus into a situation, there will be a fork in the road and people will go one way or another. They will either draw towards him or they will go to conspire against him. You know, we really don't have to do that stuff. We really don't have to. This, this really isn't important. This is a different day. It's a different culture. They, you know, somebody could have mistranslated the word of God and they come up with all these conspiring ideas that try to dismantle the truth of the word of God. But we come into contact, contact with Jesus and it says some believed on him, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus had done. Acts chapter 8, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, when they committed when they really committed. And the name of Jesus Christ. They were committed concerning the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. There's the commitment. Are you committed to him? Yes. Do you believe on him? Yes. Do you believe in his name? Yes. Then we should be baptized, both men and women, because commitment results in action. Second Timothy Chapter 1 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. I know. There's that word again. Paul was saying, or, or he was saying, I know. I know. And I'm not ashamed. I know in whom I have believed. It's not just I know about. I know him. And he said, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed. So when I make a commitment to him, we have to have the understanding that whatever I commit to him, he's able to keep. He's able to preserve and protect. Well, on the, on the flip side, will he keep and preserve and protect that which I've not committed to him? I just know that Second Timothy writes, I know that God is able to keep the things that I'm committed. We ought to commit our finances. We ought to commit our life. We ought to commit our children. We ought to commit our spouses. We ought to commit our homes. Why? Because he's able to keep that which is committed to him. We need to give it all to him, so to speak. <laughs> Jesus, I give you my life. And Philippians, to the church of Philippians, uh, Paul wrote, that I may know him. What? There's that same phrase again. Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, <clears throat> said that I may know him. Why, Paul? Because I know this. The greater that I know him, the more I'm able to believe him for. You think about it. The closer you get to somebody, and the more experiences that you have through the thick and thin, you know I can trust that person. I tr I, have you heard it? I trust this person with my life. Do you really? Well, how about Jesus? Do you trust him with your life? Paul was saying that I may know him. In other words, Paul was attributing the fact, I know that I know him somewhat. But I know there's more. And I know that if I will commit myself to him even more, God, if there's anything else that I have held back, if there's anything that I've been reserved on, that I've hesitated on, that I've delayed on responding to, I want to erase that because I know you've got more. He said, uh, and the power of his resurrection. And in the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Verse 11, if by any means... I want to know him to the fullest extent. Why? That I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He was saying, I know that I need to be fully committed so that I can attain unto eternal life, the resurrection of the dead. So Paul was saying, I want to know him more so that I can believe him for more. Would you stand with me? Paul wrote to the church of Corinthians of Corinth, and he said, but, but as it is written, I have not seen, 
nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Notice that if then. You've never seen something like this. You've never heard anything like this. I mean, this hasn't even entered into the imagination of your heart. The things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Wow. That almost sounds like a third party, doesn't it? I had, nobody has seen the things and neither has entered into the heart of it the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. What is prepared? Is love an overnight deal? Is love a temporary thing? Is love a shallow thing? No, love is commitment. He's saying, if you'll commit, you've never seen anything like this before. You've never heard anything like this before. In fact, your brain isn't sufficient to imagine the things that are waiting for you. Now, I'm thankful for getting the Holy Ghost. I'm so thankful my sins are washed away in Jesus' name by water baptism. I'm so thankful for that. But my, 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 my pursuing question is what is waiting for us that commit? If we'll commit a little more, then he will commit a little more. Jesus answered unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, there's the answer. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to the ring, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus said, if you only knew the great things that I have for you, you would ask. My question is, now that you've had experience with him, he doesn't need to convince you that he's real anymore. If you knew what he was about to give you, you'd ask. What are you willing to ask him for today? Are you willing to cross your comfort line? Are you going to walk out of here saying, man, I wish I had that. Man, I wish I had some of that. Oh, man. Or are you going to walk out of here with those puffy eyes saying, wow, I asked. And he gave would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we have seen some incredible things here today in this church. We've seen some powerful displays of your power, your compassion, your miracles, salvation and deliverance. But oh God, there's something that I'm reaching for and I know that there are people in this room that are reaching. And I'm asking you, God, what is that line of commitment that I've drawn? And I've said, I'll go up to this point, but I won't go beyond that. And yet there's something on the other side of that line that is so incredibly wonderful that it's caused me to believe you today to erase that line and say my commitment is not going to be based on boundaries. It's not going to be based upon yesterday's experience. I'm going to let you decide that, Jesus. I'm just committed to whatever. These altars are open. If you'll pray, I'm asking you to pray today and say, Jesus, whatever more is, that's what I'm giving you. I'm committing to more. I don't even know what I'm asking for. I don't even know what I'm making myself susceptible to. But all I know is this. I know there's more, and I want it. And if it costs me more commitment, then I give it to you, Jesus. Can we come and pray that today? I'm committed, Jesus.